right, it actually worked. <laughs> so welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome everybody. This is Slice of Pie. Um, I'm so excited. Uh, I'm trying to be on my better behavior. So again, this is Shelly Jeffcoat and Slice of Pie is really thrilled to have two of, I'm going to say my favorite authors of all time here. So huge shout out and welcome to first to George and then to Kim Conroy in the house. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for having us. This and is happy awesome. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. You know what? Um, yeah, before we even go further, let's take a let's take a pause. So those of y'all who are watching the live or the replay, if you're watching it within this week, happy Thanksgiving, especially in the U.S. And I hope that you're going to be celebrating some good uh, good times with family, friends, and and you know, and whomever. And obviously, please love, like, and share the video. Um, I don't even know where to start. So I was trying to I was trying to like get my mind ready for this call. I am a fan, so I will probably be fangirling out a little bit and I don't care. So I'm just telling <laughs> folks, like be prepared to, sh to see me act a fool on this channel. Um, I did actually read both books and I don't want to give away too much, um, but both books that George wrote, Watch What You Say and Aftermath. And I also had a, a picture that I took of these two books months ago on my social media pages because like I said that's what real fans do so as um as I have both of you on I wanted to find out more about why did you go into this space like what drove you into being an author how did you how did you get to where you are as as really celebrated author in your own rights both of you so maybe we'll start with Kim like how did you how did you get here well if I go way 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 back to why i <laughs> first started writing it was really because when my childhood was rough and and there was definitely some rough spots in my childhood um i would just write it all out until i felt better you know and and i was raised in a uh very country pentecostal church where when we would study the, the psalms of, of david you know, that man was singing the blues most of the time. If you yes. really dig into the Psalms of David, he would just write it all out, right? I mean, he yes. wasn't holding back. He would get in there and just pour his heart out, right? And I mean, this was yes. someone who, you know, they said with a man after God's own heart, but, but he was honest, deeply seriously brutally honest a lot of time and so that was how i dealt with things being really volatile i'll say that yeah when I was a kid. and so i would just write and write and write and write until i felt better and i think those early experiences of writing without censoring myself mm. without feeling like it had to come out a certain way or be a certain way you know i think we buy books on the craft of writing and things like this. And we feel like sometimes it has to be a certain way. And at a certain stage, plotting is good and, and, and figuring out different methods is good. But I think in the beginning, just being deeply, brutally honest and just pouring out the contents of our heart, that's where it's at. And I think readers know, they feel it when you're being authentic. And I think what people want more than anything is they want to feel your authenticity because we can go anywhere yeah. and buy plastic, you know, we can yes. do that anywhere. What we want to hear is, is show me who you are. Tell me what you feel, what hurts you. Cause those are the same things that are hurting me. And so if I go far enough back, that's why writing, that's why writing, you know, it was a bomb to my very soul at a time when I felt like I didn't have anything else. So that, that's that's why I began this, if I go far enough back, yeah. I love that, that, that like I have goosebumps <laughs> right now just listening to that because I think there are so many of us that um, that are, are in kind of that same headspace where we're looking for a, a, a way to release. And mm -hmm. so some people do it through music, some people do it through whatever other means, but for me, writing has always been that that space where you can be honest and um, and I think what makes it 
different. What makes um, what makes you a great writer is because you are showing up. Your heart is on your page is the best way I can put it, right? And so, and to your point, people pick up when it's just another canned book, when it feels like you're checking the box for the next check, right? Um, people can pick that up. It's just very different when your your heart is in it. And I definitely, um, you know, again, I, I don't care. I'm fangirling all, <laughs> all over these writers today that yeah, that that is what makes um, for me, you know, makes me want to come back and, and even pick up what's the next book, what's the next story, and be on the journey with you. What about you, George? How how did you how did you get to here? M- much less poignant story for me. Um, <laughs> you know, honestly, it's just how my my brain is wired. As soon as I could read, I wanted to write. So at six years old, I was writing plays for my stuffed animals to act out on top of my bed to entertain my brother and sister. Uh, it's just just how my my brain works uh, and it's something I just always felt called to do uh, and probably around age 30 I started to get very intentional about it and you know started well I, I joined the Atlanta Writers Club a, a local writing organization uh, here in the Atlanta area and uh, or started to get to know other writers and I discovered that even more than writing I just enjoyed being around writers uh, wow. no, when when you're a creative nobody gets you like somebody who's in that same space uh, so if you're a, a visual artist a painter an illustrator whatever nobody's going to understand you the way another painter or illustrator is going to understand you and and for writers we're just weird people uh, <laughs> We, and and you know this, you know, you probably have that experience of getting woken up in the middle of the yes. night by a character who doesn't feel like they're getting enough page time, you know, and they want a bigger role in your story and they deserve it. And why don't I, you know, drop this story and write a story with them as the lead? And, you know, and if you say that to a normal person you yeah. know, who is not a writer, they look at you like you're crazy and they're looking for the guys with the butterfly nets to come. And, take you away uh but other writers they all go oh yeah and i can do you one better you know and they all have a story that's even wackier than that uh because it's just all part of the creative process so i just discovered that i love writers and then i literally fell in love with writers (laughs) and then came (laughs) and then came too i love that you know there's something um there's something really uh, amazing about that journey and then also the community. And we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper into the Atlanta Writers Club because I definitely want to make sure that, especially for people who are thinking about writing, um, you know, just to know that there are um, communities of really talented individuals that, is, you know, and by the way, when we say Atlanta's Atlanta Writers Club. I'm talking about the prest- they're not saying it. I'm saying it. This is a very prestigious organization uh, here in Georgia. So you know, please be, please, please, please know that you know we're we're really dealing with some really um, talented, talented individuals. But the fact that there's a community that um, young writers, meaning people who haven't been in that profession for some time, can still get involved and engaged. What are some of your um, advice to maybe some of the, the folks who are thinking about writing or maybe they want to get engaged into the Atlanta Writers Club? Like, how do you how do you navigate that? You want to go first? Like how they want to get involved, if they want to get involved? Yeah. And, and just how do, you, how do you start writing? Well, I, yeah. I, I think one of the, the best things that Atlanta Writers Club offers is we have listings of critique groups and when you when you join, you can go in and find a critique group in your area. We have online and in-person. And for me, that was the biggest, the, the one biggest and best thing that I did was get involved in a critique group. And when we have the monthly meeting for the Atlanta Writers Club, where we have great speakers and great fellowship with other writers, but we also have these smaller critique groups in, in various zip codes around the Atlanta area and the outskirts and suburbs. And um, it's just so good to put your writing in front of other writers, swallow your pride, set your <laughs> ego aside, or let your ego get stabbed to death while other people <laughs> say, hey, you know, I like this, I like this. 
But over here, you know, I didn't understand who was speaking, or maybe you could clarify this a little more, just just to give you helpful, constructive criticism on your work. And it, it makes you such a better writer, but I think the best part of it is it makes you a better person too, mm. to be able to sit there, swallow your pride and say, I don't know everything and that's okay. I've got something to learn. And these people, they help make us better writers. It's, it's great. It, it was the best thing I ever did for my writing. Wow. And it's the best thing that ever happened in my life because this is how we met. We met because she joined a critique <laughs> group that I started, you know, way back in the early 2000s. So, wow. you know, we'd known each other a decade before we fell in love. Oh, wow. So, I yeah. love that. So now, this, critique groups this are whole... also a wonderful way to meet people. I was just about to say, we just, we just segued into the love story and I'm not writing this down, but this, I feel like this needs to be a book. <laughs> <laughs> and my brain just went into the two writers, the love story. Oh my gosh, that would be, please make that happen. <laughs> so Kim, I wanted to look at your book um, that came out recently and let's share that with the audience. And I wonder if you, if you wouldn't mind um, telling us a little bit about your book and the journey um, that, you know, maybe the journey on that one. And then George, we'll come back to, to, to your, um, to your um, materials as well. But let's hear, Kim, talk about your book. What is it about? Yes, yeah, Stealing Aries is science fiction, but with the romance that runs through it. And basically it's set 500 years in the future when we've colonized Mars, but the caldera underneath Yellowstone National Park has gone up because like a lot of people don't realize that there's guy there's a lot of geysers in Yellowstone National Park, but it's because there's a big old volcano underneath there, right? And it could go up. It could. And if it did, if it went up big time, you know, ash would circle the earth for depending on how bad it blew, ash could circle the earth for just generations. So you've got got people on Mars, it's colonized that ash is circling the earth so the earth can barely take care of itself crops are failing supplies can't can't get around the earth so much less look after the people on mars so they're fending for themselves so enter my heroine harlow hansen who has become the robin hood of the colonies so she's about to steal from a dormant starship that's sitting there she's going to go on there she's going to strip the gold conducting material from the starship and when she sneaks on board this dormant starship, there's a prince there who's made it his mission to wake the thing up, but he can't do it. So when she sneaks on board, it wakes up and starts speaking to her. And the prince realizes that the woman stealing from him is the key that he's been searching for. So there's a lot of issues there with identity. And, and I think one of the obstacles with sci-fi romance is I think a lot of people think, oh, guns and and romance. Maybe this yeah. is a cup of tea, you know. But there's so much more than that. You know, we have issues of identity. If she wants to go from being a thief to being on a starship, then the people in the colony think she's betrayed them. And the people on the starship think, we don't want a thief on our starship. So there's some <laughs> issues of identity and we have a nun in the story that ends up leaving her order. So she's suddenly starting a new life in her 70s. And she talks about when she removes her habit and feeling the air on the back of her neck. And she's starting. Wow. And Jack, the prince who's going to wake the starship, he falls in love with the thief. And he decides to go with the, the colonist. And he's on their side because they're basically working for slave wages and the people on Earth are using them and they're like no more and we have sort of a full circle where they end up in a don't tread on me sort of revolutionary yeah. situation but on mars yeah so history is sort of repeating itself but this time the british prince falls on the side of the colonists right so his identity is changing because he doesn't side with his family and he stays on mars and he's against the crown so there's some bigger issues wow. of identity and what do you do when everything you ever knew is changing and, and you're siding against your family. And so it's, it's more than just 
shoot them up in romance and it there's, yeah. there's more and and i think we were talking about obstacles what is our obstacles for selling our book and what are some preconceived notions you know the other day and i think that's one of them but i had started writing sci-fi romance because i said i needed a break from writing about trauma because <laughs> i had been writing uh with my daughter an ocd memoir yes because she and i both um, suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder, a very, oh my goodness, one of the most cliched and misunderstood disorders. Because how many times do you hear somebody say, oh, I'm so I OCD. Have OCD. And, yes. Yeah, I like to organize my sock drawer. You're so yeah. OCD. And they don't really quite know what they're saying because when you genuinely have OCD, it's torment. It, it, it torments you and um, it's a form of, well, she has what you would call typical OCD with, well, what most people think of as typical OCD. I would argue there is no typical OCD because it manifests differently depending on who you are. Mm. Because for example, um, would wash her hands until they bled and cracked, but the sink she was washing her hands in was filthy. So this uh. notion that all people with OCD are neat, no. Just yeah. Some people happen to have an obsession with neatness, but not all of them. Not all of them. She hasn't. <laughs> her room is filthy, <laughs> but her hands are surgically clean. Wow. But we also suffered from a form of harm OCD, which is just a crippling, illogical fear that you might harm yourself or someone else. You're not violent. You're not going to hurt anybody, but it's a repeating thought. Well, what if I do? Well, how do I know that I won't? Like you might see a murder on the, the news the news, yeah, or a horror movie and suddenly it gets stuck in your head. But how can I be sure? But how do, how do I know I won't? And then you might go to a loved one seeking reassurance. Do you think I'm a good person? And because you already have OCD, you might then get into ritualizing to prove that you won't. Well, I dropped a pencil when I was thinking a bad thought and it was at a 90 degree angle. If I pick mm. it up and it moves, you know, and then you start. Yeah. Into so we thought there's probably so many people who are embarrassed or shameful to talk about this. And they should be because my daughter had reached a point to where they were saying, I don't deserve to live if what I'm seeing in my head is true. Oh. And so we thought a memoir from both their point of view and my point of view would be good because it was the first time in my life as a parent, you, you know, I felt like I had good intuition as a mother. I felt like I even knew sometimes before my child spoke what they needed. Yeah. But OCD was the first time as a parent that I felt hope helpless hopeless like my intuition was failing me like i didn't know how to help my child and i remember just praying and, and and thinking i don't know what to do i've never felt this way as a parent it was a horrible feeling to think that i couldn't help my child and so we wrote this memoir together both from her perspective and mine and i don't ever want another parent to feel that way yeah like they're scared and they don't know what to do and even when you go to seek help you know we went through three four therapists before finding the right one because they have to be skilled specifically in treating harm ocd because not just any therapist can talk about it or know how to treat it so it's just about that journey and stealing aries was what i wrote <laughs> when I needed a break <laughs> from writing about trauma. And I loved writing the memoir, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But, um, this was fun for me to write, you know? Yeah. And the memoir it's almost was, therapeutic. It's almost a little bit, yeah. we, we, I think we're gonna have to have you come back on um, seriously, because as you were, as you were, as you were talking, as you were saying that, and ver thank you very much for sharing, sharing that about um, your daughter, because I think there are so many um, there are so many adults. This this is something that pinches my nerve. Also, when people throw out the term as if it's a 
it's that easy self-diagnosis to your point. Oh, I misplaced something, so I'm OCD or I'm busy. So, you know that you know the way that people overuse the term. It takes, it takes. Um, I don't know. It just makes it seem like it's such a joke. You know what I mean? It trivializes so it. It yeah. trivializes, yeah. And so that that's one of those things that just it just that irks me immediately when I when I hear that because my next question is, well, but were you diagnosed medically? I mean, seriously, like let's not just throw the words around. Um, I dropped the link, by the way, for for everybody in the in the chat. That and thank you. I've seen. I'm, we were on multiple channels, so I don't actually see everyone who's around, but I know that there's there's some hearts in the room for you. Um, so there's the links to uh, to the um, blog, Harm OCD. Also, is, uh, I dropped the links to your book, Kim. But I definitely think you know having you come back to talk, especially to teens um, who are um, really facing some of these issues, the stigmas around it and trying to figure out how do you respond for parents who don't know what, I'm a mom, I don't know how to respond to most things. And I have a teen daughter which you know, 14 now. So, so I definitely think that that would be a huge blessing for somebody to, um, you know, share some of the lessons you've learned. Thank you for learning the lessons so that you can teach us, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, and just to, to see that kind of love that you have on your daughter. I don't know if you saw it, George, but her face just changes. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about your daughter, your face, everything, I literally couldn't stop listening. You, you, yeah. Your whole everything changes when you're talking about the love that you have for your daughter and going through this with her. Um, and so, you know, definitely want to make sure you you, uh, you come back. But obviously, you know, everybody check out, check out the book. We also have the link in there. And um, thank you for taking that quote unquote break. I know it wasn't a real break um, so that you could give us another um, amazing um, book. Uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll just be, we'll definitely be checking again, holiday, you know, for those who are looking for a birthday gift for my, for me, you can get me that book for my birthday. Just dropping that in there. <laughs> Go ahead and do that. So, so George, I wanted to, um, talk to you about your book. I know you have other books, but I just, again, watch what you say in Aftermath, or I'm, <laughs> again, I'm just fans of. So yeah. I'm not, I don't want to give things away, but I just think I am, um, a, as a reader, and even as a, as someone, I mean, I watch, I'm, I'm, I'm a old school TV watching British mystery type, you know, very, yeah. anything that's set in like the, the 40s, 50s, and maybe 60s, that's my thing. I'm a Brit Box girl. So for those of y'all who are on Amazon Prime, you know what I'm saying. Acorn, Brit Box. That's my speed. MHZ, that's my speed. Uh, Agatha Christ Christie, um, Nigel Marsh. Those are my heroes. And for me, I think when I was um, going through your books, I picked up a lot of that. I think the character study, not to be too, <laughs> too mm -hmm. highbrow, was, was great for me. Um, what I enjoy about your books is that it wasn't simplistic. There's some books that are written where you kind of know, if I know well, kind of what happened by the middle of the book, I'm not going to finish it. I'm bored. Um, mm -hmm. I think what I, I appreciated with, with your books is that I didn't. And I also appreciated that they were um, in Georgia. So I was trying to figure out <laughs> where, where, <laughs> where things were going down in real life. So right. can you talk a little bit about these two books? And then sure. let's talk about your other your other two books. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. So Aftermath is a amateur sleuth murder mystery set in yeah. a small fictional town in South Georgia, uh, and it's about a woman who, uh, at the age of forty, uh, learns that her father, who lives in that small town, and it's the small town where she was born, and her mom took her and her brother out of that town when she was just five years old. Uh, to flee a, a really bad marriage. Uh, she learns that her father, who's been estranged to her for 35 years, has been murdered and uh, that she is the sole inheritor of the estate. Uh, and he pretty much owned this town. And she was looking to reinvent herself anyways and uses this as an opportunity to kind of start life all over again. Um, in this, this little town that she was born in, but hasn't been in for 35 years and thinks she knows, but she really doesn't. And everybody she thinks will embrace her as almost the prodigal daughter. Uh, and instead they uh, they heap scorn upon her. 
and uh, <laughs> she has to figure out why and figure out why everybody has uh, very mixed feelings about her father and uh, and why he was murdered. Uh, the cops know the how and the who and the when and the where, but not the why. And so she makes it her mission to figure out the why. And it ends up being ver her versus this little town trying mm -hmm. to hold on to all its secrets and scandals and lies. Um, and she just keeps pulling at the loose threads of people's stories and alibis and all that until she makes herself the next target for a killing and has to get herself out of it. Uh, what I really liked about writing that that story uh, was the the heroine Janet Wright. Uh, she's such a fun character. She's so snarky and funny and uh, kind of daring. Um, just in she behaves in ways that I would never felt feel like I could get away with. Yeah. Um, would you say that that's true? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, who she's, is this woman? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's got a lot of chutzpah, as my father. Yeah, would say. yeah, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, and she's got some of that New York moxie because uh, that's where her mom ended up taking her, and uh, so you know, she gets herself in big trouble and then has to has to figure out a way out of it. Um, and then with Watch What You Say, that's a kidnap thriller, but instead of the mm -hmm. usual damsel in distress, yes. uh, it's a dude in distress and the damsel is yes. trying to ride to his rescue. So I, I never much like those taken kind of movies, <laughs> you know, where it's always the, you know, the wife who's kidnapped and the daring husband with his uh, particular skill set, you know, coming to uh, her rescue. Um, I, I always thought that script needed to be flipped um so watch what me, you say is my attempt to do that um the title comes from a unique gift uh that the heroine has her name is Bo mm -hmm. ricardi and uh i've always been fascinated with neurological uh, conditions or phenomena uh and there's something called synesthesia which is mm -hmm. just the blending of senses so there are chefs in the world who are some of the best chefs uh, out there, and they're so good because they taste shapes. Whatever they put in their mouths, instead of just tasting the flavors like you and I do, they taste the shapes, and they flavor their foods based on the shape profile that they want to create in their mouths. They want something more triangular, so they add, you know, paprika, you know, where most of us wouldn't it wouldn't occur to us to do that and would turn into this this brilliant concoction that uh you know is surprising and delightful uh there are scores of musicians duke ellington Farrell williams billy joel lady gaga mary Kay blige who have a phenomenon known as chromesthesia where they see colors and shapes for the sounds they hear uh, Billy Joel has said in numerous interviews that he composes music that just the way you are sounds the way it does because he wanted to create certain colors and shapes in his mind by the melodies that, that he was writing uh, and the rhythms. And so his songs sound the way they do because of the colors and shapes he wanted to see in his mind, you know, when he was uh, playing those songs. Uh, so I've, I've just always been fascinated by, you know, this condition called, uh, synesthesia. And, uh, so I always wanted to write about it. And so I decided that, uh, it would be fun to have a character who could see shapes and colors for every sound she hears, but here's my little twist. <laughs> she can interpret the shapes and colors she's seen. And so that if you're talking to her, by the shapes and colors that she's seen as you're talking to her, she can Detect tell whether you're lying to her. Yeah. She can tell, you know, uh, when you're telling the truth, um, all of that. And so she can literally watch what you're saying. And uh, so that's where the, the title comes from. And I thought, well, what would this person try to do for a living uh, that where she could use this gift? And I, uh, I'm a big NPR fan, and uh, I've listened to, Lord, hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, Terry Gross's 
uh, show and uh, uh, fresh air. And I thought, well, what if she's a fresh air kind of uh, on air personality who interviews people mm -hmm. and she can use this ability to be a human lie detector to really coax the truth out of, out of people and get a much better interview. And so what if she's very popular because of the show and a, there's a guy who wants to get on her show for his own nefarious reasons. And the only way he can do it in his mind is to kidnap her husband and threaten to kill him unless Bo puts him on her show. And so that's the start of Watch What You Say, where this kidnapper says, I've got your husband and uh, if you don't put me on your show, I'm going to kill him. And so she's got to put him on on her show and then she's hoping that her abilities will be enough to uh, figure out where her husband is you know she's talking to this guy you know kind of suss out the truth from him but of course that won't be nearly enough she's gonna have to dig much deeper to uh, to rescue hubby so so that's that's those two books um, and, and and I write write those kind of as escapist yeah <laughs> uh, literature for me because those are my go-to's mysteries and thrillers are my go-to's uh for for my own pleasure reading uh and uh and then my my more serious books uh, tend to be historical fiction wow thank you for that i, I never heard of chromis tz mm -hmm. right i never heard of of any by the way i, I really was trying to figure out if I had some kind of superpower when I was reading the book. I was trying to figure out like what, because uh, I, I, I I know what I do creatively. And sometimes it's, I, it's not something you can explain, but um, you know what I mean? There's just some things that just hit a different way that you pick up. And it's, so I literally was like, maybe I can self diagnose myself with a superpower. Uh, <laughs> but I thought, you know, at the end of this, again, I think this is another one that is entertaining, but also you're learning something. And I wanted to share like my favorite line of aftermath mm -hmm. will not make sense to anyone outside of this call, but I'm gonna tell you what it is. And I don't, I, it's just my, it's my favorite. Okay, this is page 99. I promised that I was gonna, was not gonna mark up your books, but <laughs> <laughs> it's page 99, it says, if my father's house was the solid, hulking, hunting lodge of a man's man, David David Stark's estate was the hodgepodge sprawl of, a, of, of an eccentric genius. I don't know why that stuck. I think there is a comparison, and I was internalizing it. There is a comparison <laughs> because there was, for me, and like I said, this might not make sense to you guys, but while I have doors, I have to have this conversation, so just bear with me. So. There was something for me that um, in the way that you um, in the way that you were even describing these two these two um, residences that I was taking it so totally in a different way because I literally was standing outside of this book out of these chapters and thinking about what that comparison meant for me in my in my head how do you look at a lodge versus an estate? And so I was, I literally, this is mid book for those of y'all who will be buying this. I'm not going to give you anything more and there's more to it. But I literally stopped there because I was, I was trying to place myself um, in the mindset of the characters. I was trying to like, you know, act it out <laughs> myself. Like it is that engaging. But for some reason that happens to be the one line that really hit home because I felt like I was being, uh, put in a position where I was almost choosing the lodge over the estate, the the uh, eccentricities that come with that, that mindset is just, it was just good for me. So I just wanted to call that out while I, again, I said I was going to fangirl and I can't help it. But that, <laughs> that really, that, yeah, it did. It did make, it did make something shift for me personally in the way I was even thinking about, you know, how I could engage with the characters and that hit home for me because that is something that I don't know just made sense. So I wanted to um, find out about your other books, the non-fictions sure. now. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the historical fiction. So my my best-selling book. Ooh, get it on camera. Is, uh, <laughs> Hard is, uh, Road. Yeah, it's a, a novel called uh, Hard Scrabble Road, and uh, gosh, it's probably sold forty thousand copies by now. Yes. And um, 
it came about through uh, oral history collection uh, with my uh, former father-in-law, uh, my first wife's father. And uh, he is actually depicted on the, the cover of the book. Everything's <laughs> off of it. So, yeah, there is. <laughs> uh, that's right. So, um, so this is the oldest brother, the middle brother, and then the youngest brother. And, uh, and the youngest brother was the, the one I interviewed uh, for about 10 years, I collected wow. his, his childhood stories. And uh, he was just a, a very natural, gifted storyteller. And his stories were so about his, his growing up days in uh, Southwest Georgia in the 1930s and 1940s. They could not have been more different from the privileged middle-class suburban childhood I grew up in and uh, they were fascinating to me because he might as well have been living on Mars for you know all the similarities he had with with my childhood which was uh, other than us both both being boys zero we had nothing else in common and uh, and and so I was I was just utterly fascinated by um, his his growing up days uh, these stories were often blood curdling, uh, sometimes hilarious, but uh, almost always poignant and heartbreaking. And you wondered how in the world did they survive this childhood with a father who was an absolute psychopath and a mother who had no interest in raising her kids. Mm. Uh, and so they had to su survive during the Great Depression, pretty much raising each other, uh, you know, these three boys and uh, their their older sister and uh, and the book's done really well I think because uh, many of us have parents or grandparents uh, or now I guess great grandparents who uh, survived the Great Depression you know in the 30s and the war years in the 40s and we've heard those stories and this you know and the stories in here tend to resonate uh, eighty percent of this book is true. Uh, and you know, and and I, I've changed a whole lot, but uh, a lot of it is inspired by by true events. And uh, so I think you know, a rural people from rural backgrounds, or whose parents or grandparents or great grandparents were from yeah. rural backgrounds, remember those stories about a hog killing or what it was like to, you know, chop cotton and all of that, uh, which is you know what what they did throughout their childhood. Um, so I think a lot of people come at it from, from different ways and just stories of a very hard scrabble childhood. Uh, hard scrabble road is a physical place in the book, but it's also a really good metaphor for their journey through childhood. Um, and, and the book has done so well over the past 10 years, people kept begging me to write a sequel. So ta-da. Uh, I love that. <laughs> uh, this, this October, uh, Return to Hard Scrabble Road uh, came out. And you can see the three boys again, uh, the youngest, the middle, and the oldest, uh, but now as teenagers. So on Hard Scrabble, um, that cover is the only picture that exists of these boys as children, and this is wow. the only picture that exists of them as adult, as uh, teenagers rather. And uh, and so I basically uh, have some stories that I I didn't have in the first book, uh, and uh, and some of the uh the true stories that inspired the beginning of return to hard scrabble then i kind of spun off into you know more fictional things uh so like 20 percent of return is true versus the 80 percent of hard scrabble that's true but uh in in some ways i think it's a more fun read than hard scrabble is uh because the boys are older so they have agency um ah. in hard scrabble road most of the time you're just saying oh my goodness how in god's name are they going to survive this they're just little kids you know how are they going to get through this they have no power and they're teenagers and they've all escaped into the military uh, right at the end of hard scrabble road and uh the beginning of return to hard scrabble road they're they're in the military so they're becoming young men and and now they've got some agency and they can make decisions for themselves and they can act for themselves and it was almost more fun to write because they were able to do things that they just didn't have the power to do uh, as little little kids in uh, in hard scrabble road 
So, uh, you know, Hard Scrabble Road is kind of a literary, historical fiction, coming of age kind of story. Return to Hard Scrabble Road almost reads more like a thriller, where there's、okay. a singer at the end of every chapter, and、uh, that there's just a lot of sort of built-in momentum to the story、uh, because they're on、uh, emergency leave. Uh, from the military, and they've only got a few days to solve all their family's problems. And they actually, through trying to solve their family's problems, create more problems. So, you know, <laughs> they, they start off with a problem this big, and they end up with a problem <laughs> this big、um, through their own doing. And that's the problem with having agency: is you can also make mistakes、um, and make make situations worse. And so they. They have to learn that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, as Spider-Man always reminds us. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so they're learning how to be responsible, not just take action, but take action that makes sense and is reasonable, and will not lead to worse things.、Uh, even if the the initial action is really satisfying to do,、eh, sometimes that's not the best thing to do. So, I so they're、that. having to figure that out. I love that. Thank you for that. I think、yeah. you know, as I, I was sitting here thinking about、um, again the time of the year, and again, please, y'all, don't wait until Christmas to actually have to buy your books. Buy books all year long, all year long, and support our writers.、Um, but you know, as you were saying, I was just thinking about you know, even with the, with both of both of those books, George, that those would be great gifts for、um, teen boys as well because of the coming into. Yourself and、um, I think a lot of kids, and especially as we're trying to make the shift from being on the phone all day long, right, coming off of social media. But you have to give them something to switch to. You can't just say stop being on your phone. You got to give them an option,、uh, you know, and resources. So these for、uh, any parent who's going to be watching, I think, are really good gifts for、um, your teen boys, and、uh, obviously, you know, for parents that you know. Parents as well. I wanted to know. So I try to usually keep these、uh, these these at about forty minutes, and we're gonna end up running over a little bit because I need to ask. I want to find out like, what do you what do you read、um, on your downtime? Like, <laughs> what is what do what do writers read? Like, what do you guys what do you read to you know kind of get yourself, you know get get some get some、uh, get some other things going? Well, I'm. Part of the podcast called "Wild Women Who Write Take Flight." Yes, and because I'm part of that podcast,、uh, we have to read a lot for the authors that we interview. So that's been good, though, because it has me reading just a wide range of genres: fiction, nonfiction, all sorts of things.、Um, so that's good. That's that's what I end up reading. <laughs> like, no, if I'm <laughs> Picking a book for myself,、um, it will likely be sci-fi romance or paranormal romance because、okay. I I'm a true escapist. I like to just dive into a world that is not this one. Yes, God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. What do、I、you usually、that. read? I'm a. It depends. So I actually end up.、Um, I was kind of looking around to see.、Um, I actually like. There's a certain time of year where I end up going back to old books. So I know I, I threw out Nigel Marsh at the top, but for some reason I go back to her. By the way, for those of y'all who don't know, she's long gone, but she's just still one of my favorites.、Um, and so I go back to her a lot.、Um, she's the. She's gonna be my、uh, since I've since I've covered George's books. She's gonna be my、um, Christmas roundabout because that's I live in that world. That's just the way.、Right. You know, that's just my thing. And then、uh, outside of books, I may watch. I think there's a show now called Magpie Murders.、Um, yeah, I found out about it on BritBox, so <laughs> I might do that.、Yeah. But mainly, it's going to be between me and Nigel Marsh this this holiday. <laughs> How about yeah. you, George? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, it, this is is almost shameful to admit, but I don't have time to read. With a book anymore, even、yeah. though I I love books, I love the feel. We were talking about this、uh, the smell, the smell. 
Yes. Oh, I love the smell of a book, the, the paper and the glue yeah. and all. <laughs> it's it's stuff. just intoxicating. <laughs> um, so it, I, I love everything about reading, but I have no time to read. Um, but I'm in the car a lot and I'm doing things a lot where uh, my hands are busy, but uh, my my head's sort of... Uh, you know, on pause, I'm uh, I'm doing physical things that don't require a lot of a lot of brain power. So I like to listen to books. Ah. Uh, you know, as a kid, I was a very uh, a very much an auditory learner. Um, so I have to quite often hear it uh, before it sticks. You know, as much as you know, reading the words, and I like having stories told to me. So uh, so I do a lot of audio books and. Uh, well, right now I'm I'm listening to Michael Conley's latest Harry oh, Potter, yeah. Harry Bosch, Renee Ballard mystery. Okay. And and I've had the privilege of uh, meeting Michael Conley. Oh goodness, three or four times. The Atlanta Writers Club has held a luncheon in his honor and got a got a chance to sit next to him and you know just oh, hear his wow. wisdom about writing and all his. Uh, really really brilliant writer and one of those rare writers who actually gets better the yeah. older he gets and the yeah. more he writes uh, and and this is not often the case um quite quite often writers have their best work early on and and then it, when they get these contracts and they have to turn out yeah. a book a year to satisfy the publisher you know and this contract uh Kind of making the devil's bargain, where yeah, they get the the money, but then they also have to churn out work. The work suffers, you know, yeah. and it, you know, the twenty sixth book wasn't nearly as much fun and as interesting <laughs> as the sixth book was. Yeah. Um, and and we can all name authors. I won't do that publicly. Yeah, like they're authors. all running through my head right it, now. <laughs> come to mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And, but Michael Connolly is one of those rare writers, I think, who's actually gotten better, and his characters are more nuanced, um, and he's he's willing, you know, for the characters to be even more flawed now than they were, you know, at book six. Uh, and I just love that about him, and he's a great guy. Um, there's another author, for those who like mysteries, uh, and if you like things set out west. Um, there's a whole series of books uh, with a character named Longmire, who's a, a sheriff in the <laughs> smallest county in Wyoming, in Absaroka County, uh, and his name is Walt Longmire. So Craig Johnson is the author of those books, and um, and they're set modern day. It's not like Louis L'Amour uh, westerns. They're they're all modern day, with this uh, kind of broken down, <laughs> beat up Vietnam vet <laughs> era uh, sheriff in. Uh, uh, in Wyoming, and he's another great guy. I had a chance to to have dinner with him and and meet him on several occasions. And uh, and his writing just gets better and better and better. Um, and and the Longmire TV show is great. I was going to um, say, yeah, I've watched. I cheated, y'all. I watched yeah, the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the, I got to tell you, the books are even better. Um, oh yeah. So. And and he's just a great guy. Every time I see him on the bestseller list, I cheer because uh, uh, there are writers you really root for to do better and better and find a bigger yeah. and bigger audience. And he's one of them. He and his wife are just dear people. Just just love them. So uh, so those, those are the kind of things I listen to for fun: mysteries, thrillers. Uh, Karen Slaughter. Uh, t- speaking of Atlanta area writers. Uh, yeah. She's she's a wonderful writer. Um, you, sometimes you gotta hold your stomach a little bit because she can be uh, she can be very very uh, visceral. <laughs> um, yeah, she, she's sometimes tough to take, but boy, she can tell a, a ripping good yarn, as they would say in Britain. <laughs> Britain, yeah, I love. It. Thank you for that. So, is there anything coming up with the Atlanta Writers Club? Um, for the rest of the year, or are you guys pretty much done with yeah. the year? Oh, no, What's on the no, calendar? We're, we're, we're doing su- stuff year round. Um, so for those who don't know, the Atlanta Writers Club, which you find, you know, online at just mm-hmm. atlantawritersclub.org. Uh, we meet uh, third Saturday of every month, um, January through December. Uh, we have two speakers at every meeting. 
and they're always talking about the craft and or business of writing and we mix them up so it's never the same thing twice uh, uh let's see on december 17th uh we're bringing stephen james down from uh tennessee he's a thriller writer who also has written books about writing and he has a new book on on storytelling uh out and he's got a whole workshop he's built around that that he's going to do exclusively for us uh so we're really excited about that so that's on December 17th, uh, meetings start at 1.30. We have a mixer from 12.45 to 1.30. So you get a chance to meet other writers and fellowship and have some good coffee that, that Kim makes and, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and have some snacks and just get to know each other. And then you go into this meeting where your mind gets blown with all these uh, just sensational ideas about, about writing. Uh, and just such good people with the Writers Club. All my best friends are people I've made from through the Atlanta Writers Club. I've fallen in love thanks to the Atlanta <laughs> Writers Club. Uh, it's really, that experience has changed my life. So I'm not saying, you know, if you're listening in you know, Missoula, Montana, you should join the Atlanta Writers Club. I'd love for you to, but I, I encourage you to find your tribe, wherever it is. Yeah find people like you find a writing organization and get to know those people because uh, it, it literally will be life-changing uh, so you know then we're doing this uh, memoir writer and screenwriter in January at the screen wow. uh, January meeting so and on and on different things every month um, because we got so many different folks we got to have different strokes um, we also do lots of conferences and that's where I spend most of my time as executive director of the club. Uh, we do two traditional conferences a year. Uh, so our 28th conference and I've done them all, uh, 28th will be on May 5th and 6th where I'm going to have at least 18. I may have just found my 19th, uh, agent and uh, acquisitions editor who works for a publishing house uh wow. I have at least 18 guests but probably 19 agents and editors you can get your work critiqued from you can pitch to um, they can help you hone your query letters um gonna have a great author and actress named tanya todd who's going to be talking about writing diverse characters wow um, just all kinds of opportunities to learn the, the business and the, the craft of writing, but also get a get a leg up and get your work seen and uh, maybe get an agent representation yeah. contract, maybe get a publishing contract. Uh, goodness, we've had well over 30, I guess we're, we're in the 40s now, maybe getting close to 50 people who've gotten uh, contracts as a result. And one has gotten a big movie and TV deal as a result yeah. of that experience. And then if that wasn't enough, we do a self-publishing con conference uh, and that's April 29. And that'll be two tracks, people who are just kind of self-publishing curious um, or just getting started with self-publishing and need the mechanics. And then those who have self-published books out who want to learn about marketing and you know other aspects of running this business for yourself, because yeah. I think that's what a lot of self-published authors don't appreciate is they have become entrepreneurs uh, yeah. and they have to learn how to run their own business. And, and that takes a lot of, a lot of skill sets, uh, a lot of things you got to master. And so the self-publishing conference is to help those folks who are pretty much learning how to, how to run a business for themselves. Uh, so just, a just a lot of things we do and, uh, and look forward to, to having people join us. Oh man, this, this is, there's so much, there's so many incredible opportunities, whether you're a writer today or you aspire to be a writer tomorrow, um, yeah. for, for folks to really get involved with Atlanta Writers Club. And even if you're not in the area, you could, you know, listen, go check out what's available online. There's, I, there's still good information, you know, still take the opportunity to network and meet if you're in the area, you know, try to get to an event and meet other writers and build your community and then kind of take it from there. I am so sad that we've come to the end of this. Um, I mean, I'm I'm literally, you know, I don't know how to close this out because I don't want y'all to go. It's Let's so just fun. keep going. It's just, you know. We got time, the kids enough. are in the other room. Right, I know, time. like I've, I've locked my family out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're, they're in there, they're fine. They're yeah. in there. 
This is so incredible. I'm so grateful um, for both of you um, to come on and give your time and share with this platform. And I think this is going to be really helpful for a lot of folks who are currently writers, who are aspiring writers, who are fans, um, who just want to learn more about the people behind the book jacket. You know, it's very different when you, you meet the actual writers, you know, to get to hear what your journey was like. And I think it gives you more of an appreciation of the end product because people don't see the, the journey, they see the end product. Well, now you know what, what it took to get here, at least get a glimpse. And we're just excited that you're here. So um, we will tell the folks goodbye, but you guys hang out in the back room for a minute and uh, we'll have our after party, which <laughs> only only we're, we're, we're attending. We'll just over to it. <laughs> Thank you, All Shelley. right. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, guys. Thank you, you guys hang on one second and I'll, I'll uh, close this out. Everybody, thanks for watching and drop your comments. All the links are in the chat and, and I will see you next time. Take care, y'all.